Section eight of The Bookman, March nineteen twenty one, by various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Ferrard. The Bookman, March nineteen twenty one, by various. Section eight. Dreiser after twenty years by edward h smith on the dollar book counter of a drug store the first night of this year i encountered jenny gerhardt no doubt this most palatable of the dreiser novels had been for some time in happy enthronement beside the opera of robert chambers rex beach zane gray and the female gasp starters of our common letters yet the sight arrested me and the shopkeeper's assurance that he had sold quite a lot of copies had the ring of the incredible dreiser with even a small popular audience with any sort of soda fountain following seemed somehow beyond the border of expectation within the week dreiser himself magnified this portent with the news that the financier is soon to be issued in german by kurt wolf of berlin and twelve men in french by ryder at sea sister carrie the titan and jenny gerhardt are also to have french publication from the press of edition de la serienne and the last named book is to appear serially in la so this abused ubermensch among our novel makers is discovered in the act of invading home popularity and reaching at the same moment the elevation of international audience it was entirely by accident that these bits of news about the fortunes of theodore dreiser came synchronously with an interview he gave me from the ermitage in california where he has been in tropical hiding for a year the opening notes of this fugue of dreiserian opinion deserve to be sounded here in juxtaposition to the report of his personal progress do i think there is any tendency toward liberal letters in america he demands echoing my question i do not evidently he is not beguiled by the wan light of his own slow illumination he finds the night that broods upon the creations of fine letters in this country as black as ever the vast surges of philistinism and puritanism seem to him still far too strong and noisy for the little voices lifted among them he expects america to treat its artists no better than of old he considers the moving picture finer than most of the books it dramatizes we shall listen to him at length presently curiously and sadly enough it is now all of twenty years since the young dreiser saw his first novel issued and the edition all but suppressed and it is nearly twenty since sister carrie was published by heinemann in london where the book received its critical baptism it has taken the greater part of a generation for this significant literary figure to reach such success as comes to the common spew of sensational novelists in a lustrum looking back over most of this period i remember with pardonable mirth that sister carrie came into my hands seventeen or eighteen years ago and that when i passed it about for the enlightenment of my colleagues on a certain western newspaper hugely impressed by the vision and truth of the book wondering that an american had done it the novel was greeted with the same critical shibboleths that have reigned about the head of dreiser ever since the editors and reporters of this obscure sheet found the book immoral and not representative of american life dreiser's penetration was termed unprofitable digging under the hardpan and the whole crew summed up with a damning judgment he can't write plainly this author was destined for no pleasant voyage the self-same brabble and roar to use thomas hardy's phrase has greeted each new dreiser book as it has come from his hand 
and the identical grenades of blind and dull opposition have been thrown upon all his product year by year it has become a little more difficult to neglect disregard or contemn this man and his work the schoolgirl reviewer of books who serves the great bulk of american newspapers of all ranks finds it increasingly embarrassing to write condescendingly of a man who has long ago made a tradition among the discriminating the pulpiteering critic has long since broken his last lance against the imperturbable dreiser mill but he continues to charge at every opportunity with his pointless weapons giving the angels and the hereafter strong meat of mirth for some years no person of mentality and taste has paid the least attention to the dreiser detractors the wesleyan complex is too well understood to leave this novelist's moral judges any tatters of serious habiliment by dint of enormous steadfastness incredible labors in the face of heart-breaking reverses and treacheries dreiser has forced his way to commanding position in our literary procession but the better public is unbelievably small readers of fine works are so sparsely strewn among us that not a single periodical devoted to sound and progressive letters has survived among us unless extraneously supported or devoted to some blighting propaganda the man who attempts to feed and clothe himself with the returns from uncompromising books faces always the spectre of starvation and the unsustaining prospect of posthumous regard since dreiser is now in his fiftieth year and no more certain of long survival than the rest of mankind there has been some reason for the fear that this latter fate might overtake him he is still by no means certain to witness either reward or recognition to match his labors or his desert thus it is heartening to find even the first indications of widening fortune for him part two what sort of man is this dreiser what strange meat does he eat what is his secret these are questions always in the minds and often on the lips of his remoter following attempts to describe the man physically and interpret him mentally have been made so frequently and with such varying results that the reader of his anna must find himself confounded apparently the man's friends and commentators find him as difficult to encompass and describe as the populace finds his books to digest edgar lee masters finds the misused theodore a soul in rapt demiurge stalking life he relates that he has a mouth cut like a scallop in a pie and is a gargoyle in bronze arthur davison fick discovers that he has a large laboring inexpressive face the late harris merton lyon descants upon him as simply a tall ungainly unlovely man with something of the cast of oliver goldsmith's features something lumpish something rankly vegetable is evoked what a huge rutabaga a colossal pith-stricken radish and so on in endless extravagance seven or eight years ago i encountered dreiser in the flesh a tall loose-jointed graying man sat on a bench in a greenwich village restaurant humped down over a table toying with a napkin and listening a little sadly to the babble of his companions he was silent and abstracted apparently absorbing what was being said and busily culling out for himself what was worth remembering there was abundant chance to observe him and make note his face seemed to me then a little pale and more than a little heavy his bluish eyes looked dull and inexpressive save when he laughed then they appeared to glance anything but humour rather depression discouragement at mankind he laughed or guffawed often and usually at something that amused no one else i thought at first he was laughing in some mistaken notion of being polite 
soon enough i discovered that his explosions were outbursts of inner feeling discharged to hide the vibration of some chord of pity pity again for mankind three or four times in the course of two hours he had more than a yes or no to contribute to the conversation and what he said was insignificant and immemorable i had then already heard and read a great deal about the man and i remember trying to separate my ocular and first-hand impressions from concepts already formed on examination the man before me seemed nowise extraordinary i could find none of the rude strength the fierce passion the brutality i had heard so much about instead i saw a man in whom i believed to sense pain defeat bafflement resignation the face was perhaps unhandsome but there was a light and expression about it that struck me at first acquaintance as fine groping and pathetic i should have said that the man behind that mask was kindly certainly understanding i wondered if some of his reported brusquerie and rudeness might not be a shield to hide certain weaknesses and failings i was soon enough to find the whole legend of this terrible man reduced to nothing more than a certain abruptness and social awkwardness due directly to preoccupation and shyness the lion-like dreiser of the yarns has always been under my eye the most lamb-like of men though i make no doubt he has teeth well i have glimpsed him often and often in the intervening years at work at play sad and gay depressed and triumphant at times even widely talkative though the habit of silence and receptivity does not come off him easily even still i fail to find the symbols of those vasty descriptions anywhere about his form or aura sherwood anderson assures us that dreiser is old very old gray bleak lumpy hurtful no doubt if your eye is confused by your memory of the dreiser character procession and his philosophic evocation my string of adjectives for theodore dreiser is somehow barren of these disconsolates to me he is tall and shambling tired shy timid always tentative absorbed and absorbing hungry searching penetrating slow inexhaustibly weary pitying and pitiful he is also jocular and frequently boyish he is romantic without having many of the graces of the romancer he is superficially inexpressive and annoyingly inarticulate at the wrong time a quality which sometimes reaches over into his writing and blurs many an exuberantly conceived passage i assure you he is not a vegetable or lumpy he has a pension for palm beach suits and slender canes the last time i appraised him he seemed lean and getting leaner there was an air almost of the dapper about him though his lolling gait undid the impression far from the sum total of impressions to be got from his pen photographers this man who is charged with nothing so frequently as with constant preoccupation with the sordid and ugly is aesthetically sensitive moved by a picture or a bar of music quite capable of being sentimental and generally a little mystic the truth is that beauty sways him and enslaves him and hurts him but his beauty is not of the common sort there is a loveliness too bright for the semils of the herd they have had their revenge by denying its existence dreiser is i apprehend one of those who will testify that it is sometimes a torture to have eyes for no other nothing has been so much written about by the fervid interpreters of the dreiser personality and so stupidly assaulted by his critics as a certain ponderosity and lack of humor in the man i do not know why americans consider that a great man must also be a funny fellow perhaps it is because such empty and sterile phrases as the saving grace of humor and the salt of wit have been adopted as a public creed 
it would not be the first time that our people have built a faith about a few hollow words notably from our political oratory which happens to be about the lowest in the world but the idea persists and has been used to the detriment of this serious artist certain it is that there is little levity in the man and no wit he does not play facilely with either words or ideas again life affects him as immensely tragic hopeless and piteous he has not the heart to jest he is neither gallic nor celtic there is a greek fatality about him and what he visions yet the man floods with laughter he is constantly breaking into the disconcerting mirth i have already described used to conceal some other emotion but he is also full of a large mastiff-like playfulness which he accompanies by successive and sustained detonations of bass laughing an intrusive mongrel pup bent on burrowing its way up the dreiserian trousers leg has been known to divert him to the point of collapse and i have seen the rogueries of messrs potash and perlmutter confound him with guffaws i can remember the time when i was convinced the man kept his cool silence even in the circle of his intimates because of inability to talk and there is some truth in the notion he is naturally neither vocal nor articulate and talking confuses him but i think there is another reason for the silence dreiser is constantly and i think for the most part unconsciously absorbing everything and everybody about him he has the passion for observation and acquisition necessary to his work he does not talk for fear of missing something he is too busy receiving to give forth one evening when i asked him to dinner there was a striking illustration of his absorptive powers among the notables at a long table in the amiable barbetta's wine den were a rosicrucian adept a moving picture magnet a bank robber a musician a few assorted painters and two or three newspaper men one of the last came with the determination to call on dreiser for a speech to stand him on the table and have him talk to the assembled diners or some other madness the thing began at six and wound up at one the movie man talked himself hoarse the rosicrucian monk grew breathless with revelations the artists proclaimed a new theory of beauty only dreiser and the bank robber were silent the novelist sat all evening drinking in everything taking into mind a phantasmagoria of conversation sufficient to unseat the reason of a mirandola giving out no more than a desultory fire of guffaws and an occasional question when the proprietor finally uttered us into the early morning dreiser took the musician under his wing and started for greenwich village where both lived some time before two they reached the latter's studio and went in play me some strauss and debussy and tell me about them said the writer still unsatisfied insatiable the pianist pounded away for two hours pausing now and then to rest his hands and explain just before four o'clock dreiser got up skinned on his coat and clapped his hat on his head and stalked off with hardly a word home to sleep on his mental gorge the recording of such trivialities needs perhaps to be excused on the ground of an attempt to present a more intimate and detailed view of the man than has yet been given whatever critics have understood theodore dreiser have commented upon his aloofness and detachment his dispassionate and tolerant insight his compassion for the swirl of men and motives about him his loneliness in the multitude someone has referred to him as a man on a high hill h l mencken notes the gesture of pity which is in all the dreiser work 
these qualities in the work and the man are of course complementary and they both explain and question a certain loneliness or remoteness is in need of the creative artist and it seems to me that this quality is especially necessary to dreiser not only because of the kind of work he does but because of the manner of its doing i imagine that he works slowly and with great effort unless he has recently yielded to the drudgery lifting powers of the typewriter he writes everything slowly and deliberately in his close but vague chirography i fancy that words flow no more easily to his pen than his tongue and that enormous imposts of time are necessary to his vast output hence it seems probable that dreiser has had to train himself against time-consuming friendships and social pleasantries he has had to restrain his enthusiasms whatever they may have been he has closed his mouth and opened his ears closed his doors and widened his eyes so we have here a man friendly but so far as i know without an absorbing friendship and probably incapable of one a man closely touched and moved by all the pathos of life akin to all suffering and yet endlessly remote it is perhaps not altogether the fault of such a man if he permits himself no complete intimacies with his fellows this yielding belongs first of all to his work again it is certain that this particular artist's experience with men and their world has been a little too disappointing to leave much spontaneous gregariousness i can remember several occasions when i was unfortunately a witness to some of these clashes when the genius was suppressed at the nod of the vice snoopers there were several honest efforts to aid the novelist or at least to hearten him against the iniquitous stroke these movements served more than anything else i think to bring out the jealousy and pettiness of our writing crew and to throw the novelist back upon his inward strengths upon his solitariness again when dreiser brought a group together to promote a society for the aid of aspiring authors a project he had long nourished nothing was accomplished beyond an exposure of selfishness and log-rolling i think i have seldom seen a man so hopelessly alone as he seemed on this evening part three i do not believe there is any tendency in the country toward liberal letters the novelist began when i asked him for an expression of opinion there is unquestionably a growing audience for books of a liberal character but the growing clan of the lovers of those contrasted with those who love a flipper and a bakery or a small insurance business and who find that they have neither time nor the mind for anything above the mere matter and necessity of making a living is as one to ten or twenty thousand i mean that literally not that americans are not intelligent or let us say slick in a commercial and material way they are in any material and mechanical way you cannot put anything over on them they usually sense about what you are planning to do and proceed to do it first but the same people who can build a moving picture concern a great popular magazine a bank a real estate concern or something of that sort when it comes to letters of a liberal and artistic character are as dull as oxen they literally have no conception of art in the scriptic sense i am thinking of de maupassant flaubert chekhov france wilde poe de annuncio shaw moore hauptman well extend the list yourself in fact nearly all yes i can safely say all who have attempted liberal and artistic writing in america in the best sense have failed not of artistic achievement in the main but of public recognition and support let us begin at the beginning take poe is his artistic product really not marvellous can you resist its appeal and was he not lied about and misrepresented and literally tortured by the 
rude and crass attitude of the public of his day consider griswold that malicious falsifying preacher in letters venting a cheap commercial jealousy and spleen upon a man so far above his level spiritually that he should have approached him on his knees and to this day we have the trashy newspapers and the trashier magazines still hawking the same old lies and the same old cheap commercial misunderstanding and abuse which irritated and confused him then i marvel that the man wrote anything at all it has been only a year or two since the atlantic monthly in an article written by that master critic bliss perry grudgingly admitted him to the same table with howells stevenson mark twain and if i am not mistaken bret hart as i recall one paragraph of this excellent critique it pictured poe as saying to himself that he was entitled to sit with these masterminds and so concluded the admirable perry he would be right but would he america never did and never will understand the spiritual needs of a man like poe our people cannot grasp the artistic temperament or value the work of a temperamental artist step on a little and look at walt whitman consider only the noble and even religious attitude of the concord school of literature and art how standoffishly he was patronized by emerson holmes lowell the author of prue and i and their ilk i haven't any doubt that longfellow that third-rate rhymester thought he was dreadful a low fellow not fit to come within a hundred leagues of parnassus but i certainly need not recite this history to you nor to say what i personally think of whitman to this day the soundest appreciation of him comes from abroad sidney lanier was a poet of no mean ability he flourished or was neglected rather between the seventies and the nineties the marshes of glen and corn are no mean poems they are excellent in my judgment far better say than anything which mr longfellow or mr holmes or mr lowell or mr emerson as poet i mean ever wrote but was he recognized or made anything of he was not no recognition and no market such is his simple tale the noble mark twain compromiser with convention that he was and a mere clown artistically compared to poe was himself sniffed at by the college and magazine fraternity of boston and new haven and franklin and union squares until very well along toward the end of his life i recall picking up one day in the office of a publisher a history of american literature written by some college pundit of the day and bringing the story of our various masters down to say eighteen ninety eight or nineteen hundred the book was then but newly published and in it was no mention of twain save at the very end the very last page if you please where in summing up a few negligibles it was admitted grudgingly as one could see that in the last few years a few of the books of one mark twain seemed to have a popular appeal of a sort yet in the same volume were long and serious estimates of e p rowe louisa m alcott hick marvel nat willis and a score of others now entirely forgotten i saw this book in nineteen o one but that is not all by any means in my day this is from eighteen ninety five to six at which time i first took notice of things literary i have seen quite every book of any real literary distinction as well as the author of the same american i mean properly and in some cases deliberately neglected i have reference to such writers as henry b fuller author of with the procession and others harvey white author of quicksand will payne author of the story of eva stephen french whitman author of predestined i k friedman author of by bread alone harold frederick author of the damnation of theron ware and judge grant who wrote unleavened bread most utterly and completely neglected wild huzzas for such writers as richard harding davis 
owen wister winston churchill the rev cyrus townsend brady f hopkinson smith robert w chambers and so on but not a worthwhile critical word for any of these men they were and remain outside the pale of decent american letters in almost every case they succeeded in writing but one book before the iron hand of convention took hold of them will payne wrote the story of eva a fine piece of american realism and then quit started to make a decent living by writing for the saturday evening post stephen french whitman quit after his predestined not a thing since norris wrote mcteague and the octopus then he fell into the hands of the publishers who converted him completely to the pit a bastard bitter romance of the best seller variety hamlin garland wrote main travelled roads his one book by the way and then diluted a clear realistic vision with as much sweetness and light as he thought would keep him respectable on the calling lists of american manufacturers of ploughs and elevators and saws possibly and sell a few more books after that well you know the rest even chambers wrote one good book the king in yellow proving that he could have written more of the same he deliberately chose the best-seller grade i fancy unquestionably jack london did so i have read several short stories which proved what he could do but he did not feel that he cared for want and public indifference hence his many excellent romances the novelist turned from the experience of authors to consideration of the public and its taste no distinctly our american world is unfriendly to letters in their best or truly interpretive sense he continued an american outside of his business cannot possibly look life in the face in trade he will lie cheat swindle steal lure trap rob and slay in every conceivable fashion moving heaven and earth to destroy his competitor and seem better than he is but when he reads or writes assuming that he can do either he wants and expects the world to be pictured as a realm of surpassing excellence in his books all men must be honest kind and true all women more especially his wife and daughters pure as driven snow there are no cruel sneaky conniving business men in all the walks of trade such as he ornaments none at least not in his books but read the sweet mush on the editorial page of the average american paper how good all these business men are or should be then turn if you will to the records of the courts before which these men are called to answer for their crimes it is to laugh but no american book must reflect that it is low sordid not the sort of thing the people should read because in good sooth it gives one a bad impression of the american business man the american father the american son the american mother the american daughter hence the writer of a serious interpretation of america is more or less a scoundrel a low fellow i hope i have the honour to be one you ask me about criticism well in the face of such conditions how can the serious and discriminating critic any more than the serious and interpretive writer flourish your best critic like your best writer must not only have something to interpret but he must be allowed to interpret it in other words have a market for his interpretations once he has found a writer or two or ten to interpret in america the best a critic of this stature can do is to pen a lament to the effect that he has so little to write about the things he can laud or enthuse over are few and far between it is a significant fact that our best contemporary critics of both the book and the stage are not only loud and bitter in their denunciation of the annual american literary output but also of the immense audiences which the same persistently obtain they laugh and swear at the authors and playwrights as the case may be but they laugh and swear even louder at the public which accepts them so enthusiastically of really exceptional men they have 
very little to say because in truth there are so few at work in america one critic solemnly proclaims that he is tired of hearing the same few writers over and over even so but who or what is to blame the critics the writers or the land itself i say the land the time is not propitious for fine letters america is too busy constructing material equipment for more life at best art is a by-product it is free surplus joyous energy something over and above material necessity perhaps the american has not reached that free material state where he can afford to pause and think aside from material things of course it may be that once he has built all the needful bridges dug all the needful mines erected all the needed skyscrapers built all the necessary roads and factories and machines he will pause to meditate upon the many things he has done and the manner in which he has done them possibly but also possibly not in my humble judgment or according to my taste the great works the commercial and financial planning and execution ought to go hand in hand with great pictures and plays and books which should somehow picture and interpret the same maybe i am wrong perhaps this is not the way perhaps this can all be done best after the fact but can it i have the feeling that if it is not well and beautifully done now it will never be done rome did not interpret itself and so remains uninterpreted greece truly interpreted itself in many ways and so we know greece russia england and france have done well very well more particularly russia but how about america the great century that recently closed for instance the one through which we are living now i think we have precious little to show for them i asked dreiser who has been in touch with the motion picture industry and its people for a year what he thought of the cinema despite many defects he said i think the movies show more of an advance than our current books or plays as i see most books and plays they are somewhat more sensibly interpreted in the films than on the stage or between cheap covers some moving picture directors appear to have more brains and tastes than most of the authors whose works they handle yet this is not a clean bill of health for the movies by any means they have a long way to go but they give some evidence of being on their way the trouble with movies as they stand and as they apparently must remain is that they are a composite of applied brains and borrowed ideas but even so they are in the main truer to fact than the books and plays from which they are taken part four to those who have been put to thought in the matter there is certainly enough little that is new here either as fact or as dreiser doctrine in the end the wonder is not dreiser's that poe wrote anything at all in the face of personal slander and artistic misunderstanding but a general marvel that dreiser keeps steadfastly on his way in the teeth of organized commercialized capitalized philistinism such as was unknown two generations ago no one can write of this man without wondering and searching at him as a most provocative phenomenon his is the only sustained fine phrase sounding in the cacophony of american fiction-making the facts as to his life are well enough known he was born in terre haute indiana in 1871 the twelfth of thirteen children of a woolen weaver whose factory was destroyed when theodore was a child leaving the family in sorry poverty he is of rhenish catholic blood and his father was not only a devotee but a zealot his much older brother was the celebrated paul dreiser the broadway king of lowbrow balladry whose popularity twenty-five years ago was as profound as his younger brother's more recent neglect for a number of years theodore dreiser was a newspaper reporter employed on dailies in chicago st louis cleveland and new york his sister carrie was begun while he was reporting on a western newspaper and its completion followed his advent in new york 
where he also wrote short stories for a time edited various magazines for a number of years and finally quit the commercial literary field in disgust and went resolutely back to his novel writing dreiser attended the indiana public schools and was for one year in the state university then necessity forced him out into breadwinning he was never out of the country until he had reached forty and begun to be celebrated he has read foreign literary men only in translation since he speaks no languages have his own remembering even the germans of his parents most imperfectly the newspaper work of the young dreiser shows itself as a much more vital factor than any of his critics have noted or his apologists admitted nothing is so certain as that reporting opened his eyes and stripped him of a thousand illusions no other experience teaches men such sovereign contempt for names and reputations such healthy scepticism of externals and masks such clear understanding of the motives which yeast under the surface of life and bring about its actions and reactions in no other profession is curiosity about life and its individuals that noblest of vices practised as a recognised art with its conventions and its highly developed technique dreiser himself confesses the journalistic debt on a hundred pages on the other hand much of the loose careless bad writing this author has done the one thing that has always given his stupid detractors something real to hang their plaints upon is also to be charged to newspaper work the journalese cries out from almost every page of the writer's text the solecisms of the reporter are everywhere the stock phrases of the headline builder and the lead writer ring through his golden thought with brassy dissonances all this has been said nauseously often but always without understanding of the cause the truth is that dreiser's whole technical training as a writer has been acquired in the news foundries and that he has since been too busy observing interpreting and translating life to observe in the elemental struggle between man and nature between self-constituted right and helpless truth to devote time to the correction and reconstruction of his writing any writer who has once fallen into the mire of the journalese is doomed to spend the rest of his life cleansing himself or to go unclean personally though i have myself been fool enough to cart and bluster at his inept writing and to urge all manner of changes i am certain now that any attempt to make a stylist of the man or to divert his thoughts from the thing he is trying to say to the manner of its saying can only result in ruin if flaubert can be rated among the immortals for his style despite obvious faults of philosophy and sense and despite occasional preoccupation with the merely libidinous so dreiser ought to be exalted for the content and inner beauty of his work letting the matter of scriptic nicety rest for those who insist on seeing dreiser as not quite american it may be suggested that his constant journalisms form the only semi-polite language that has had its origin among us and for those who persist in the asinine sweeping assertion he can't write there is the truth that many passages of dreiser's best work ring with an eloquence and sincerity beyond the achievement of any of the stylists so dear to the mealy mouth there is in a respectable body of his writing a beauty beyond common conception and a literary effect often laboriously but always tellingly achieved dreiser is not a schooled craftsman to be sure that is why there is an appalling unevenness in his product he is in the main an instinctive artist whether he knows how he gets certain effects seems to me doubtful at least i never expect to hear him articulate enough to reveal the method our obscurantists will certainly never accept this man and never grant the truth of his work not because as they set up he is not typical of america but precisely because he is so faithfully america's expounder and depictor and so inescapably the product of this country and this time
his naive approach to many of the refinements of life his insatiable youthful curiosity about everything matters the most weighty and the most trivial his untiring and unstinting energy his very cumbrous and laboring application of force to great obstacles and his triumphant surmounting of them all these things belong to us and to our time no other people in no other social state in all the cortege of history could have wound this man there is thus an indefeasible difficulty in finding the literary cognates of dreiser h l mencken long since set down conrad and hardy as his only recognizable relatives and this judgment seems to me accurate and penetrating not that either of those men writes or constructs remotely after the dreiser fashion but that both think and feel and see their subject as he mr mencken calls attention to the guerdonless questing of these men the seeking without finding as he expresses it hardy has put into his own verse this view of the plight of mankind this brick cimmerian through which we grope and from whose thorns we ache while still we scan round our frail faltering progress for some path or plan there is it seems to me in these three sons of disenchantment a marked difference of progress along the road of disbelief and disavowal hardy strikes me as having arrived in his senectitude as a positivism of negation he no longer doubts he denies nothing of the old faith of mankind remains he has trod all but the last reaches of the path he knows it ends in nothing all his scanning has disclosed nothing in conrad on the other hand there is still the passionate note of questioning the bitter bright song of the seeker but unless i fail to read into him something that is there he seeks without hope of finding without any deep wish to find his only philosophy seems to me expressed through man driven darkly to his day's work by some blind energy driving blind matter and whither he rarely asks dreiser as i apprehend the man is not yet so remote not so sure of his negation not ready to detach himself from the woe of men not long ago i asked him a little idly i fear what conclusions he had come to about it and about what changes time had etched upon himself here is a paragraph from his letter i think for one thing i am much more philosophic than i once was for which fault may whatever powers there be forgive me next i may be somewhat less romantic though i doubt it in some respects i think i am a better liver not so depressed about the tragic aspect of things the thing takes on the look at times of a very badly played melodrama at other times i get a little cross but that is only when i cannot find refuge in either work or play i never can and never want to bring myself to the place where i can ignore the sensitive and seeking individual in his pitiful struggle with nature with his enormous urges and his pathetic equipment as i see him he is too often a poorly armed and undernourished and none too courageous private sent over the top at dawn against his wish or will in the face of a veritable hell fire we should all of us like so much to live and be somebody in this great indifferent and cruel swirl and only see what in the main happens to us think back over the many you have known so many who have tried so hard and failed are in my thoughts too much perhaps when i think of them as i do a great deal i haven't the heart to get too gay as the expression is here is the already mentioned gesture of pity but there is also about it the strong movement of fellow-feeling the absence of chill detachment there is no jovianism here and no nietzschean contempt for the weak and worthless just this absence is one of the outstanding stigmata of the dreiser work i must confess that he is often all too human for my palate too much involved in the drama so there is in theodore dreiser's questing still the human note of wishfulness i do not think he expects to find 
consciously he probably does not hope to find but in his unconscious there labors still the pitiful deep hunger of mankind for some satisfactory and impossible solution perhaps this explains the much noted preoccupation of his with the so-called unseen world with semi-mystical subjects such as underlie some of his minor work whether this is only mild concern or whether its hold upon the writer will augment with time seems to me a matter of vital interest but one which cannot now be discussed for lack of evidence at any rate here you have a man who stands leagues aloof from all other literary figures in the country and may not be seriously compared with any of his predecessors excepting the two or three abused masters says sherwood anderson the feet of dreiser are making a path for us the brutal heavy feet they are tramping through the wilderness making a path presently the path will be a street with great arches overhead and delicately carved spires piercing the sky along the street will run children shouting look at me forgetting the heavy feet of dreiser i think the children will not be able to forget end of section eight Section 9 of The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. Section 9. The Poems of the Month, December 1920 selected by louis untermeyer no spectacle is more ludicrous to the gods and to men than when man the fallible attempts infallibility let a person begin to set up as an oracle let him judge anything from a poetry contest to a dog-fight and his friends yielding to the universal distrust of man in the role of the omniscient will first rally then avoid and finally waylay and do away with him the contempt in which umpires are held is significant having profited by these conclusions i wish to disclaim any pretense of judging the poetry of any month the outstanding feature of december seems to be but why should i hesitate to be dogmatic the outstanding feature is the group of four poems contributed to harper's magazine by robert frost but having said this much it is difficult to choose one of the quartet for quotation all contain the frostian characteristic the distinction of utterance coupled with an unusual dignity of mind the quiet magic that without ever raising its voice is so eloquent in north of boston and the later lyrics the first of these four the sharply condensed fire and ice will find new niches in forthcoming anthologies while grapes a feminine companion piece to the boy swung birches is delightful in its whimsical picture magnificent in its last ten lines the valley's singing day is one of frost's loveliest lyrics i select his the need of being versed in country things chiefly because it reveals this poet's half-ironic raillery as well as his fresh apperceptions the background of the burned house is never allowed to become grim and the birds that in such a poem would be humanized and made to cry over the ruins well one must be versed in country things not to believe the phoebes wept e a robinson's sonnet vain gratuities illustrates that intellectual and technical precision which distinguishes all of this author's work from the early the children of the night eighteen ninety four to the recently published the three taverns this is craftsmanship of a high order and something that is far beyond technique the last two lines of the sestet reveal one of robinson's favorite effects a way of capping a casual and almost colorless poem with a sudden brilliance amy lowell's a grave song 
which appears in the same number of the new republic as robinson's poem calls attention to the decided leap forward which this weekly has taken in the quality of the verse it is printing miss lowell's sharp quatrains are in her best macabre vein as a fourth choice i have wavered between william ellery leonard's crushing protest the lynching bee from the nation and osbert sitwell's intense little lyric dead man's wood from poetry i quote the latter chiefly because leonard's fierce outcry is over four hundred lines long the need of being versed in country things the house had gone to bring again to the midnight sky a sunset glow now the chimney was all of the house that stood like a pistol after the petals go the barn opposed across the way that would have joined the house in flame had it been the will of the wind was left to bear forsaken the place's name no more it opened with all one end for teams that came by the stony road to drum on the floor with scurrying hoofs and brush the summer mow with the summer load the birds that came to it through the air at broken windows flew out and end their murmur more like the sigh we sigh from too much dwelling in what has been yet for them the lilac renewed its leaf and the aged elm though touched with fire and the dry pump flung up an awkward arm and the fence post carried a strand of wire for them there was really nothing sad but though they rejoiced in the nest they kept one had to be versed in country things not to believe the phoebes wept Robert Frost, Harper's Magazine A Grave Song I've a pocket full of emptiness for you, my dear. I've a heart like a loaf was baked yesteryear. I've a mind like ashes spilt a week ago. I've a hand like a rusty cracked corkscrew. Can you flourish on nothing and find it good? Can you make petrifaction do for food? Can you warm yourself at ashes on a stone? Can you give my hand the cunning which has gone? If you can, I will go and lay me down and kiss the edge of your purple gown. I will rise and walk with the sun on my head. Will you walk with me? Will you follow the dead? Amy Lowell, The New Republic Vain Gratuities never was there a man much uglier in the eyes of other women or more grim the lord has filled her chalice to the brim so let us pray she's a philosopher they said and there was more they said of her deeming it after twenty years with him no wonder that she kept her figure slim and always made you think of lavender but she demure as ever and as fair almost as they remembered her before she found him would have laughed had she been there and all they said would have been heard no more than foam that washes on an island shore where there are none to listen or to care edwin arlington robinson the new republic dead man's wood in dead man's wood the rustling trees shiver shudder in the breeze the bird song drips on dead man's wood trickles through like falling blood and if the sun gives forth its light the yellow glory turns ash white the dark tall trees when day is past draw back their leaves pale and aghast when rusty shadows fall at dusk surely the spirit leaves its husk all night all day within this cover i sit and wait for my dead lover osbert sitwell poetry a magazine of verse editor's note each month the bookman will select a group of poems from the american periodicals these will be submitted to a prominent poet or critic who will choose from them the poems of the month though he will be free to add any others he may prefer mr untermeyer will act as arbiter for march and april the complete list of poems selected will be found in the gossip shop End of section 9
by various this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. reading by matt perard the bookman march nineteen twenty one by various section ten america and the young intellectual by harold stearns an answer to the national genius in the january atlantic monthly in the atlantic for january stuart p sherman has the leading article called the national genius which is somewhat of a misnomer inasmuch as the substance of the discussion is really a hortatory appeal to our younger artists and writers the article is written with humor and vigor it is extremely able and clear setting forth a definite point of view the implications of which suggest a consistent philosophy of life it is because mr sherman makes articulate an attitude more or less consciously shared by the majority of what we may term the tolerant and enlightened part of the generation preceding us and because in common with a much larger group of the younger generation than mr sherman suspects i believe this attitude a rather tragically ill-informed one that i have ventured to reply to it the problem of america and or as i should say versus the young intellectual and why in the simplest sense of interest in intellectual things should we hesitate to use the term why should it carry with it a faint aura of effeminate gentility is of first-rate importance discussion of it illuminates many aspects of our cultural life and never was it more timely than to-day let me begin by stating as straightforwardly as i can mr sherman's main contentions mr sherman pictures himself at a typical american public dinner which h l mencken might characterize as a rotary club jubilee entirely controlled by rugged right thinkers at all events there is much talk of progress and efficiency increased production sanitation and sobriety and a future republic flowing with milk and honey so potent that everybody will then have a flivver a phonograph and hundreds of classical records a patent sewage system and a wireless telephone as well as an individual aeroplane to transport him from his immaculate home to his electric tractor ploughed field or to his model factory churches and universities will flourish and all the high roads be macadamized citizens of this ideal state will be diseaseless active moral and above all prosperous the picture of the future united states is the conventional roseate utopia dreamed of by all forward lookers and mechanical engineers it is to be american through and through that is shot thrown through with moral idealism perhaps as an afterthought the chairman of the dinner then calls upon a young literary artist to sketch a place in our program of democratic progress for art music literature and the like in short for the superfluous things the phrase grates on mr sherman as evidently it grated on the young literary artist in question for this gentleman whom mr sherman makes the protagonist for all the younger generation of literacy and artistic revoltes then arises and delivers himself of the following blasts one that the twin incubi of democracy and puritanism have made beauty a prostitute to utility and that the younger generation of artists and writers has seen through the solemn humbug of a future ideal republic envisaging the failure of civilization not only in the present but in the future two that the said younger generation wants only to be emancipated from the kind of people that have spoken earlier at this dinner for it imports its philosophy in fragments from beyond the borders of anglo-saxonia 
from ireland germany france and italy not forgetting to draw upon the quick semitic intelligence three that art is letting oneself out completely and perfectly and that the chief thing to let out is the long repressed sexual impulses recently unearthed by that prince of psychologists professor sigmund freud for most of the evil in the world is due to self-control now the justness of this touching picture of the younger generation of artists and writers i can hardly leave to mr sherman's conscience he may personally know individuals of the type described above but i don't and i frankly doubt if many such individuals exist certainly if they do they are not typical the picture mr sherman has sketched is a caricature in the true sense of the word i e a kernel of truth covered by different individual absurdities and weaknesses the kernel of truth of course is in the depiction of the younger generation as in revolt against the right thinkers and the forward lookers it is in revolt it does dislike almost to the point of hatred and certainly to the point of contempt the type of people dominant in our present civilization the people who actually run things i shall even go so far with mr sherman as to agree that this is a thoroughly unfortunate state of affairs unfortunate for the people who run things but even more unfortunate for the youngsters the fact of the hostility is not in dispute but i do most vigorously dispute the reasons mr sherman gives for its existence the individual irresponsibility he implies quite the contrary is the case as i shall try to show later however to return to the argument mr sherman goes home rather sadly from this dinner meditating on the folly of youth and reflecting on the love of notoriety in all ages the restoration fellows too he ponders were likewise in revolt at the puritans they let themselves out with a vengeance did not two wits and poets of good king charles the second's time strip themselves naked and run through the streets singing lascivious songs yet somehow they did not count these restoration revoltes they made no headway against the sense of the whole english nation they left no impress and to-day hardly their names are remembered mr sherman continues to meditate beauty he says whether we like it or not has a heart full of service it is impossible to separate art from the service to truth morals and democracy our forefathers were not grim did they not envisage among the inalienable rights of mankind the pursuit of happiness the artist must send us these moments of happiness and delight as often as he can but he does so permanently and most truly not by divorcing himself from the moralities of our time and custom and inviting us to sensuous indulgence but by kindling the austere ministers till they glow with passion further there is the whole question of the relation of the artist to society can an artist divorce himself from it or be in fundamental revolt against its chief characteristics mr sherman thinks not but then what is the chief characteristic of american society its moral idealism he replies adroitly quoting emerson whitman and thoreau even mr spingarn and mr dreiser to prove that we have this vital national culture thus we come to the conclusion that the artist should try to make contacts with that national culture fertilize it and be fertilized by it he should so to speak climb on the national bandwagon of moral idealism and see that a few gracious aesthetic roses are festooned around it as he hurries along the hard road of ethical and material progress first of all let me set down my points of agreement with mr sherman the problem of the relation of the artist and writer to the society in which he lives is a very old one and it seems to me a great deal of nonsense is talked on both sides of course no artist can completely escape his milieu 
and of course in one respect all great art is disinterested timeless equally true for all ages and all peoples universal yet there is no real conflict here and as in philosophy the problem of the one and the many or unity and diversity has so to speak only a speculative interest so in life the artist although expressing something universal must do it with the materials with the technique and in the idiom of the particular time and country in which he finds himself he will thus be disinterested in his art or his form of generalizing the particular only in proportion to the sharpness and keenness of his interest in the specific he cannot in any final sense put by the civilization he lives in and i think it basically true that a really great artist or writer will express the age to which he belongs he will speak the language of all humanity yet usually in a provincial accent in this sense i agree with mr sherman after all great art is art of acceptance and fulfilment of life rarely of repudiation and contempt and never of indifference here allow me a relevant digression in the freeman for the issue of the week of january twenty sixth albert j nock one of the editors offers a few words of advice to messrs st clair lewis floyd dell sherwood anderson and waldo frank whose latest novels all of them dealing with contemporary american social life and with the life of the middle west in particular have appeared with a curious and provocative simultaneity all of our novelists mr nock implies and these younger men no less than the others write with a certain preoccupation they have not their inner eye on the central truth of the situation or the ultimate truth of the characters they depict both of which are independent of time or place they are preoccupied with the externals to the detriment of their art which should concern itself solely with great emotions great spiritual experiences great actions many of our older novelists like mr howells were primarily concerned with niceness as a different stamp like william allen white are primarily concerned with morality and americanism so called but the younger writers equally put their primary concern in disparagement of niceness morality and americanism mr nock cites the example of gogol in rebuttal to them all gogol he says although he lived in a regime of russian despotism and bureaucratic stupidity beside which the recent ministrations of mr palmer and mr burleson in our own country appear the handiwork of mere amateurs still contrived to do classic work and he did it by ignoring that regime by putting by the civilization he lived in the qualities that distinguish his work are tenderness disinterestedness and serenity and these qualities could express themselves in his work in spite of a hostile environment but mr lewis dell anderson and frank go and do likewise is mr knox's advice let them also forget their environment in the sense in which gogol did let them not be preoccupied with it to the extent of allowing it to impinge even for a moment on their art they can do classic work no matter if the republic fails and the japanese occupy california and the mexicans new orleans now although it would no doubt be an excellent thing if our young novelists captured some of the qualities that distinguish gogol's work that is if they came by those qualities honestly and not imitatively i cannot help feeling that mr nock is giving advice where it is not needed namely to geniuses provided mr lewis dell anderson and frank are geniuses they will not need mr nock's advice anyway provided they are not geniuses it cannot do them any ultimate good neither i nor mr nock nor mr sherman need to worry about the real genius when he appears he will be simply able to look after himself he will ignore his environment or repudiate it or challenge it or change it as he pleases 
furthermore i also cannot help feeling that gogol's genius great as it was was a rather narrow and special one and that the truly great artist does not put by his contemporary civilization but that he reflects and justifies it one thinks of pericles and shakespeare and rabelais universal to be sure yet each one impossible in himself without his peculiar age and civilization for strive as we will to put aesthetic values at the top of the ethical hierarchy and i confess i think that is where they belong in order to be at that top there must be something under them a man is a man and a citizen even before he is an artist and in the work of the highest genius it seems to me all the claims of these different sides of life are coordinated and and unified yet in any event whatever the question about a t special type of genius such as gogol ignoring his civilization or about whether the highest type of genius does or does not ignore it and i certainly believe he does not there can be no question at all that the young intellectual the person not a genius yet with a certain confidence and a real interest in humanistic things must give heed to it he will perforce be a part of the social and economic and educational machinery of the country albeit it may be only a dissentient part he will be interested in politics in contemporary literature in the type of university life we possess in science in art and the american theatre and the labour movement he cannot and will not wish to escape any of these interests there will be the insistent problem of making a living in an environment where admittedly interest in intellectual things can hardly be said to yield quick or high dividends above all there will be as mr sherman himself says quoting from the forefathers the pursuit of happiness as a rational individual he will desire for himself a happy or as aristotle puts it the good life he will recognize that he is a social animal and will try to find expression of and satisfaction for those sides of his nature but he will likewise recognize the core of irreducible individualism that remains the spiritual integrity as a separate entity that cannot be destroyed and the happy life will be for him the life in which these two legitimate claims are harmonized and reinforce one another thus far i can go along with mr sherman and i fancy he would agree with the general propositions advanced in this paragraph the trouble comes when we try to apply these general principles concretely what is the national culture which the young man finds confronting him in america to-day and what are types of leaders of that culture with whom he is supposed to make contact mr sherman describes that culture as one predominantly of a long and vigorous tradition still in active functioning of moral idealism he hesitates to name the leaders of it that is the contemporary leaders for there is a sentimental passage about lincoln which by implication suggests that his spirit still lives in his successors it is not my business to quarrel with mr sherman about what really constitutes american national culture although i believe he is thoroughly wrong in his judgment as well as a single phrase can describe it our genuine national culture i think is one of almost belligerent individualism to be sure a certain pioneer social docility went with us for in a new country where living was precarious and dangerous all within the group had to conform if it was to be successful in its adventure when nevertheless the pressure of that social conformity became too great to be endured the individual could always go west either alone or with his family he could strike out for himself and lead the kind of life he chose worship god as he chose precisely this type of adventurous pioneers unafraid of the hazard of new dangers did people our country it is their spirit i think which still constitutes the real american national genius 
however much that genius may be smothered and thwarted to-day in a land that is rapidly filling up and that has already passed the turn from an agrarian to an industrial nation a good many of the younger generation would be glad to see a return to that early sturdy individualism i myself think affectionately of my new england forefathers who kept their blunderbuss well polished and hung in a conspicuous place on the wall ready for highly individualistic use against the exactions of any too tyrannical government however forgetting for the moment the question of tradition what are the facts will mr sherman seriously maintain that he finds a genuine moral idealism dominating the country to-day surely he is not so naive as to confuse the reformistic and uplift tendencies of our national life the pollyanna optimism prohibition blue laws exaggerated reverence for women home and foreign missions protestant clericalism with anything a civilized man can legitimately call moral idealism if he looks things squarely in the face he must recognize these manifestations of american life as in no way related to moral idealism they are the fine flower of timidity and fear and ignorance if mr sherman were not so hostile to freudian psychology that he persistently refuses to understand it if ever there was a scientific justification of the ethical need of restraint it is to be found there i should point out to him that this so-called moral idealism is merely what any good psychiatrist would instantly recognize as the morbid perversities which conventionally accompany a deeply dissatisfied human life for it hardly needs arguing that moral idealism begins with intelligence the trouble with what mr sherman is pleased to describe as american moral idealism is simply that it is illiterate it is on the same basis of reasoning as that of a fanatic who says that because there is adultery in the world we should kill off all women or because there is murder we should cease to make knives and pistols it is the moral idealism of outward compulsion as against the moral idealism of inner restraint the moral order that comes from authority as against the moral order that comes from freedom which does mr sherman really prefer it is significant that he does not mention the leaders of this national culture let me be specific suppose a young man just out of college and returned to his moderate-sized home town in ohio why not marion honestly tries to make those contacts with the national culture which mr sherman so vigorously urges him to make first he tries business where will he find the idealistic business man with a vision of a future great moral republic i mean a real vision and not a hypocritical pretense put on for the sake of the neighbors next he tries politics where can he in fact go but to those leaders who took a local pride in rolling up a big majority for brother warren then he tries reform and the labor movement can he go to a better place than to the leader of the local women's christian temperance union and possibly to the enthusiastic local manager of a national open shop campaign finally he tries music art and literature but here my hand falters the picture is too pathetic perhaps he ignores all these activities he wants merely to live a gracious and amiable and civilized life for himself to be part of an interesting and intellectual social group and do his work honestly within it forgetting the harshness of the environment frankly has he one chance in a hundred does mr sherman seriously imagine mr anderson being fertilized by contact with his congressman myself if he knew my liking for wine being enlightened by talking with mr volstead mr lewis becoming civilized by long conference with dr wilbur f crafts no what the young intellectual actually finds is that moral idealism is precisely what the institutional life of america to-day does not want for moral idealism if it means anything means fearlessness before the facts and willingness to face them 
intellectual integrity emotional honesty the attempt to win a moral order out of the jungle of experience without bias without any axe to grind without native prejudice this kind of moral idealism the younger generation has in large measure and it is just this kind of moral idealism which the younger generation finds nowhere existent in american national life today the whole drift and direction of our national life under the control of a malignant and stupid minority fears this kind of moral idealism as it fears hell itself in our national life today the young intellectual speedily finds that he is not wanted and particularly he is not wanted if he strives to accomplish just those objects which in the abstract mr sherman would be the first to praise i mean intellectual integrity and personal honesty before the facts of life mr sherman should try to put the problem to himself as concretely as i have attempted here sketchily to do if he did he would avoid his most serious blunder of all the notion that the young revoltés are merely so for the sake of personal indulgence and because they find moral discipline irksome nothing could be more grotesque they revolt simply at the hollowness and hypocrisy of the standards they are supposed to worship they revolt not in order to avoid discipline but in order to take the first step toward a real discipline i e a discipline based as far as may be on the truth they do not revolt for the fun of it even if a few roosevelt invented the phrase lunatic fringe and like almost every other group the younger men have theirs appeared to do so they revolt because they passionately want the opportunity to do honest work serious work intelligent work and they know what mr sherman for all his scholarship seems never to have learned that such work is impossible unless they are free and futile unless the civilization it occurs in welcomes it critics have often wondered why we have not produced great art and literature perhaps here we have the explanation i have already hinted my own belief that great art is the expression of an age and that age must itself be great ours is not it has nothing to express this in itself would be nothing much to weep over many ages have been fallow but it is discouraging to find this curiously persistent hostility on the part of the older generation of course in point of view not necessarily in age toward all of the younger generations attempt to make our national life a little nearer to greatness to make it more honest more fearless more intellectually straightforward more humanly free more rational of course our young intellectuals waste much time in discovering the hollowness of our institutions of course their tone is often fretful and peevish of course there are always those to identify freedom with mere running away from life and playing like a happy animal yet surely a man of mr sherman's intelligence and sympathy should be able to discern the reality beneath the appearance the fact remains he does not and when i say he i think of the whole class he represents even the intelligent and tolerant desert us can we be blamed if we suspect that beneath the ostensible reasons lie others fear primarily fear that an honest attempt to understand our point of view might make them deeply uncomfortable and dissatisfied it is only a suspicion but it is a growing one meanwhile let mr sherman reflect upon it while we of the younger generation make our plans for leaving the country of our birth and early affections we do not want to cut ourselves off from our national life but we are inexorably being forced to do it many of us shall probably starve when we go to some alien country but at least we shall be able spiritually to breathe End of section ten. Section eleven of the Bookman, March nineteen twenty one, by various. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Ferrard. The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. Section 11. A Talk with Charles Dickens' Office Boy by Catherine Van Dyke. Muffins, muffins, hot muffins, crumpets, ho, crumpets, ho, who'll buy my crumpets, ho? With many a twist and quaver, the muffin man gurgled the merits of his wares and emphasized his cry with a bell whose vigorous ring made the great tray balanced on his head fairly teeter yet owing to some by-law of gravity especially made for london friars the tray maintained its balance as if muffins and all it were a pursuit appendage of the muffin man himself the whole of fetter lane rang with his cry the quaint alley of old london where i had come to see mr edrupt former office boy of charles dickens was filled with tea-time folk hobbling or toddling in all the seven ages of man and goodness knows how many of women heads were muffled in shawls the air was cold despite the warm look of the yellow fog that wrapped the alley in a sort of pea-soup twilight in which its inhabitants wandered dimly after the muffin man like a crowd of merry ghosts pennies rang on the big tray and with crumpet or muffin secured the alley mates scurried back to the various niches that only a cat or a londoner could call home from each opening door gap came the chirp of a kettle a merry high diddle diddle kettle the fairy of the english heart come in madam pray come in pressed mr edrupt after i passed under the low medieval arch that led to the little house whose ground floor made his parlor bedroom william edra stood up to the dignity of his eighty years his back slightly rounded like that of the windsor chair he offered me while his eye twinkled steadily his own kettle on the hob was of an operatic turn i took the long two-pronged fork and held my crumpet close to the red embers while mr edra set about making tea in the glazed pot according to the recipe so stiff the spoon could stand upright his little room held all the treasures of eighty years of small comforts to-day his record is almost unique here is an office boy who didn't want to be boss and who didn't turn out a millionaire he remained content as an office boy until almost middle age when he became a gate man of the temple i looked down at his boots and thought i had seen none blacker nor better shined in all london the gleam of the boots led my eye to a polished copper penny with a hole through its metal guarding a place of honour on the centre of the mantel mr edrupt smiled my master mr dickens gave it to me the first year i was his office boy i was just a small lad about eight years as i remember when he picked me out of the lot who applied for the job my mother took me to him not because she was a reading body and knew mr dickens books she had thirteen children and never read a line but because boys had to go to work early in those days and she had heard mr dickens was a good master i remember quite plainly my mother looking down at me and saying william is a good boy sir mr dickens looked hard at me and laughed i am almost afraid of good boys he said but i think william is not as bad as all that i grew up in the office running his errands to printers carrying his packages he was always sending off something to somebody sometimes i was sent out to fetch ices of which he ate considerable though he ate very lightly of everything else sometimes when he had written hours without stopping he would suddenly jump up and bid me go out to the street with him and then we would walk and walk i'd stand it as long as i could then i'd tell him my legs ached and we would come right home and have cake i think mr dickens was a man who lived a lot by his nose he seemed to be always smelling things when we walked down by the thames 
he would sniff and sniff i love the very smell of this he used to say now i am not a reading man myself mr edrupt warmed my tea with a fresh bit but i think mr dickens liked my not being one have you read anything of mine yet william my boy he used to ask me no sir i'd answer and he would slap me on the back and laugh every time one day he asked me william do you know what a jimmy is yes sir i answered proudly they say you are one mr dickens threw back his head and laughed and laughed and then rushed out to tell a friend i did not know till long after that what i had heard people call him was a genius and not a jenny now about that penny mr edrupt's eye met mine and he went back to his story for his mind was almost too richly full of memories to dwell long on one i went to mr dickens first at the office of all the year round in wellington street he had a bedroom fitted up there and used sometimes to spend the night when he lectured or took part in theatricals he did that often but i don't think he ever spent a night away from home when he could help it for no man loved his home better when mr dickens wrote mrs lirriper's lodgings three hundred thousand copies were sold in the magazine a great sale in those days the street in front of the office was crowded with folks wanting to know the end of the story there were big posters up all over the town and i was fairly bursting with pride for i knew how hard mr dickens worked at it i loved all his successes though i don't think he cared anything about them so long as his work was done sometimes he would scarcely eat or sleep when beginning a new book but when the pages covered with writing began to pile up i knew that pretty soon he would ease off considerably sometimes after mr dickens had written for hours i would give him a bucket of cold water and he would put his head into it and sometimes his hands then he would dry his head with a towel and go on writing well folks everywhere were betting considerably on the end of mrs lirriper's lodgings it came out at christmas time one real sharp man tried to have me get mr dickens to tell the end of the story he intended to sell out the news and make bets on it i asked mr dickens again and he knowing i had never read the story questioned me until i told him the man had offered me sixpence to try and find out what was going to happen mr dickens the old man continued gave me three shillings a week and every time my ma had a new baby which was often he advanced me a shilling but having to give it home i could only keep two pence a week for myself my master knew this and that the sixpence the man offered to me for telling the end of the story meant a lot to me but when i told him the man wanted to sell out the happenings to others he said come here william boy and he took me on his knee i'll give you sixpence now for yourself and i'll give you this penny with a hole in it if you promise me to keep it for good and ever but you tell that scoundrel that i say the end of the story is this they all die sooner or later mr dickens looks in answer to my question he was one of the best dressed men you could ever see downright stylish everything he had was always of the very best and he took the greatest care of his things in every way i never saw a spot on anything his clothes or his desk i used to think his gloves beautiful as any lady's i used to tidy up his desk but it was always tidier before i touched it i think his notes and books and papers were always left just right he wrote with it well i was not allowed to sharpen it i never saw mr dickens angry with anyone who dealt fair with others though he could get in a terrible rage over anyone who did a mean thing he could remember everything in a really wonderful way sometimes gentlemen would tell me addresses to bring horses to and i would forget them but even if it were a week after mr dickens heard them in the office he could name the street and number he was also very prompt 
never a moment late in anything and when i was late i got scolded for it oh yes of course i saw lots of writers coming and going out of the office and oftentimes i went to their homes but mr edrupt paused i never took any notice of them once i was carrying mr dickens bag to the station when he was going to his home in kent and another boy said to me who are those two men looking in the front of that shop window the one in the checked trousers velvet coat and soft hat is the premier mr disraeli i told him the other is my master they were both laughing at a cartoon of dizzy as we called him with his head stuck on a broomstick mr dickens family often came to the office i remember mrs dickens well she was very stout and could hardly get her crinoline through the door my master loved his children he loved all children but his own he fair adored he would stop work and turn right round and spend his whole afternoon with them sometimes he'd take me and we'd all go on an outing many people asked if mr dickens was a great eater as they say he always put such a lot of things in his books about eating all sorts of feasts and good dinners they tell me he wasn't but a light eater himself outside the small room i stepped into the strand the fog had cleared somewhat of its yellow gray and i could not but imagine how dickens might have portrayed the london of to-day its abrupt contrast against the dimness of the medieval before me was the black-timbered ye cheshire cheese where samuel johnson the shadowing boswell and his friends supped on lark's pie and wit when times were good and as poor goldsmith might have vouched on just wit when times weren't dickens too and his cronies had their evenings here and most who have trod fleet street know its hearty fare to my right gleamed the shop brilliant with the electric foot warmers in the middle of the strand roaring with its evening traffic the church of st clement's day stood islanded reminder of the days when london was the centre of denmark dim set above it the london paris air express was concluding its daily trip around me were the streets with names dickens must have loved maple alley glasshouse alley hanging sword alley each held its magic a motor lorry stood before the building where once rose the magpie and stump to which the laundress directed mr pickwick in his search for one perker's clerk motor scooters scooted autos hung little nels crept shyly past and little dorrits their shawls drawn over their heads david copperfield's aglow with romance sauntered from the great newspaper offices that tower here in the medley was that oliver twist far over in the dimness of the bridge arching the thames with an old thick man scurrying after him yet in all this background so reminiscent of charles dickens nothing gave such a vivid glow to his memory as did william edra who doesn't yet quite understand why all the rest of the world is interested in his master's books End of section 11